He has focused on pedestrian-oriented designs as a senior walkable communities advisor at Victoria Walks. Duane has recently completed extensive research on mixing pedestrians and cyclists on shared paths. He will outline these issues and infrastructure options that work for both walking and cycling. Please welcome Duane. So, so Victoria Walks really started to get interested in uh, shared paths when we did our research on seniors and walking. Uh, we commissioned Dr. Jan Garra, who's a well-known uh, cycling and walking researcher from Deakin University, to uh, look at the issues of seniors and walking. And that involved quite a significant literature review, an analysis of the VISTA transport data, a pretty major survey with over a thousand um, seniors responding, and uh, focus groups. And, one of the, and there's a link there, you can see that research is available on our website. And we, we saw from those results, when we, we, when we asked seniors what were the impediments that they faced when, when they were walking, um, one of the sort of more significant ones that came up was bicycle riders on shared walking and cycling paths. About 39% of them said that it was a moderate or major constraint to their walking. And you can see there, there were obviously some other significant ones as well with um, dogs off leash or out of control being number one. But when we asked them also, how, what could we do to um, make walking safer? Uh, this is when we really started to notice cycling coming up as an issue because better cyclist behaviour on shared paths and reduced cycling speed on shared paths were the top two responses we got back. Uh, so we realised at that point that there was a significant issue for seniors um, in sharing uh, shared paths with cyclists. And the focus groups really kind of just provided a bit of life to that finding, I suppose, <laughs> just confirmed that finding. Here's a, here's a couple of quotes there. Um, and I think the bottom quote certainly illustrates the issue. Uh, this notion that you have to share has to come with more thought. And uh, I guess that's what we look to do with our research is to think more about shared paths and, and get a deeper understanding of where they work and where they don't work. The issue was confirmed for us too when we started doing some work for Vision Australia on a road safety audit tool for pedestrians who were vision impaired. And uh, the first part of that work that was done by Vision Australia was a, a, a study that was done by Newark where they actually surveyed uh, about 600 people with vision impairment and about their experience in walking in the community. And about 8% had been involved in a collision and 20% in a near collision in a five year period. So really high rate of collision and near collision for that community. And about a quarter of those collisions or near collisions were with bikes. Um, and they also surveyed vision impaired people about um, different um, situations that they face when they're walking in the community and the situation where they had the lowest level of confidence was in interacting with cyclists. They, vision impaired pedestrians have generally low level of conf confidence in most situations and the only situation they are confident with is crossing a traffic light. So we, under, we determined to undertake some research on shared paths. So what we did was a literature review of the research that's available with a particular focus on the Australian material. We had some discussion with some subject experts um, and we also consulted with councils. Uh, MAV, faci MAV facilitated that. And we had about um, 18 councils provide feedback to us on the first draft of the paper. And what you see is that the vision for shared, the original vision for shared paths is not really matching the reality. So this diagram is kind of complicated, obviously. But what it basically says, this is from uh, Ostrode's uh, Guide to Road Design. It, what it basically says, and it's a, a flow diagram that helps you choose your infrastructure. 
what infrastructure you use for what situation. So it basically says that you should use shared paths where the pedestrian or cyclist volume is low, and they should be really low, about 10 cycles per hour, or 10 users per hour, or cyclist speeds are below 20 kilometres per hour. So it's a, a vision of shared paths as really low use or low speed. But in practice, that's, we are getting that in some places, but not in all places. And certainly for our busier shared paths, uh, it's quite a different situation. So um, about three quarters of our recreational paths on metro, metropolitan trail network, which were intended for leisure use, are now high transport use. And as part of our research, we looked at the available data that was out there about how fast cyclists were travelling on shared, on shared paths, and it varies a lot between users and between paths and between points on paths. But as a general rule, cyclists are travelling between 20 and 30 kilometres per hour on shared paths. That's the sort of average. And obviously, 20 to 30 kilometres per hour is faster than 20, 20, 20 kilometres allowed per hour or less that Australians envisage. And there's some really interesting studies out there about shared paths. Um, a lot and a lot of studies were done that were observational studies. People watch a path for a certain amount of time. And those studies almost always, although well, there's some exceptions, but they almost <coughs> always conclude that there's no problem. Because when you watch the path, you don't see a problem. But the user experience of those paths is quite different. So when people have been surveyed, they often perceive a conflict, a conflict or report a conflict. And um, so you get results, for example, like the survey of walkers on Sydney foreshore, where 8% have been knocked over by a cyclist, and 33% have been frightened by one. And interesting, interestingly, from the cyclist perspective, um, there, were one, there was one focus group where everyone, all the cyclists basically reported being involved in a, in a collision or a near miss. And probably for that reason, when you survey cyclists on what sort of infrastructure they'd like, um, and Vic Rose did some research on different sort of shared path configurations versus segregated paths and so on. And about 7% of cyclists said that they really like travelling on shared paths. They kind of like shared paths generally because it's not cycling on the road. Um, but in terms of really liking shared paths, only 7% said they did. Whereas a segregated path, 66% said that they really like cycling in that context. Now I'm just going to talk a bit about perceptions of shared paths. It's quite important what you, how shared paths are perceived. And uh, there's a bit of an issue in that, in some contexts, shared paths are described as cycle paths, even by the asset managers, the councils that, that manage them. Um, and describing shared paths as a bike path uh, is really problematic. What we know is that people have um, People are unclear, relatively speaking, about the need, the legal requirement to give way, for cyclists to give way to pedestrians on shared paths. And there was an interesting study in Sydney where they looked at a range of different shared paths. And only one of those paths had more cyclists than walkers. Typically there were more walkers than cyclists. But it was really interesting that the the response of the users to that situation. So on the path where there were more cyclists than walkers, more than half of walkers who met a cyclist took evasive action. They either, and generally that meant either walking to the side, moving to the side of the path, or moving off the path altogether. Remembering of course that theoretically it's the cyclist that should be taking evasive action to move around the walker. Um, and that, but that level of evasion on that particular path was between three and 45 times the amount of evasion that 
by pedestrians that took place on other paths. So in other words, on other paths, the pedestrians weren't seeing the need to get out of the way of the bikes. But when they were on a path where there were more cyclists than walkers, they felt the need to get out of the way. And some of the implications can be significant. So, and it really goes to um, the pedestrian's role on the shared path and the pedestrians being marginalised on shared paths. So this is an example of a man who uh, was at a tram stop in Northcote. He walked onto the shared path um, and hit by a cyclist and the police report says that he walked onto a bike path. The implication being that he sort of stepped out onto the road kind of thing, or walked into an environment he shouldn't have been in, but in fact he was just walking on a shared path. Now, I'm going to start talking a little bit about sort of what, what do we do um, in response to this situation. And one of the responses that we've seen is converting footpaths into shared paths. And that's particularly problematic for a couple of reasons. Firstly, they're not fit for purpose. They're not designed as shared paths. They don't generally meet the shared path standards. Um, for reasons we've seen before, it's intimidating for walkers, and particularly more, more vulnerable ones. And it's, it's often confusing because you get situations where, like this one here, where um, a cyclist, this cyclist was really required to dismount and they go across that pedestrian crossing, but they've got a shared path leading up to that crossing, so of course they just continue on their bike and smile for the camera. <laughs> um, so, what, so what do we do about solutions? Now clearly, managing behaviour on shared paths is, is an important thing to, to try and do. And um, we need to reinforce the, the fact that there's a legal requirement for, for cyclists to give way to pedestrians. We need to communicate that simple fact clearly in, this, in our signage and so on. And we need to um, say to cyclists that they should slow down on shared paths. But the reality is we don't really have any way of controlling cycling speed on shared paths. Um, it's not, we don't have the same mechanisms for controlling cyclists that we do for, for cars on the road. And if our objective is to encourage both walking and cycling, we don't particularly want cyclists to be sh slowing down either. We want them to provide, we want to provide them with the capacity to move quickly if they're cycling for transport. And what it comes down to really is that much, much like if you've got a road if you need a sign to tell people to slow down on the road, if you need a sign to tell people to slow down on a shared path, then you've probably designed your path wrong. We've got the wrong type of path. So we, we're advocating for, for a greater use of separated paths. That's generally what happens in Europe. Um, and obviously Europe is the model in terms of high rates of walking and cycling. Uh, we have a bit of an issue in Victoria in that the Victorian guidelines don't say that we should have, we don't definitively recommend that we should have separated paths unless we have very high numbers of cyclists over 600 per hour at the peak. And um, that's actually quite, that's not consistent with other guidance like the Queensland guidance and it's also inefficient. Once you get to high numbers of walkers and cyclists you're actually, you actually get more efficient movement on separated paths of the same width than you do on a shared path. So we've reached the conclusion that um, we should be looking at separated paths where we've got a situation where there's more than 50 cyclists per hour in the peak hour. The peak hour is important, I think, because uh, it's the commuter cyclists that we're most concerned about in terms of large volumes uh, rather than sort of slow speed recreational cyclists. And that number of 50 um, is roughly reconciled with the guidance in some of the European countries like Norway and the Netherlands. <coughs> uh, just a note on the growth areas. Um, we're certainly advocating that in the growth areas we should be either we should either have low speed environments where cyclists can safely ride on the road or they should have separated off road paths. Um, we think there's, there's room for them. This is an example of how that could work. Uh, this is one of the precinct structure plans 
from Wingdom, where there's a, um, a separated cycle path. And ironically, in the same um, in the same precinct structure plan, they are advocating shared paths on um, pr primary arterials with a uh, road reserve greater than 40 metres. We we've certainly been having some conversations with Vic Roads about this, um, and to start with, that was a little bit frustrating in that uh, we're being told there's not enough room for separated bike paths and footpaths in a, in a road reserve which is more than 40 metres wide. Uh, but we're hopeful that we've, uh, the Vic Roads have come round to the view that separated paths and footpaths are the way to go rather than shared paths. So just to sort of sum up, we would say avoid shared paths as your infrastructure choice where there are many elderly or pedestrians with vision impairment, where you've got large numbers of walkers, uh, probably the number there is around 100 per hour, and where you've got a lot of commuter cyclists, more than 50 per hour. And to give you some context around that, that um, there would still be a lot of shared paths. The majority of shared paths would have less than 50 cyclists per hour. So there is a place for shared paths, but once you get to higher numbers of cyclists, then we really think there should be separated paths. And for cyclists, it's really about giving them separated off-road facilities or safer roads with low speed conditions. So uh, we're just sort of um, preparing to release this research now. We've got a, a position statement, a short four-page position statement, which is available on our website already. Uh, we've got a larger um, research paper which sort of documents the whole study, which will also be on the website. In fact, it's already there, but um, we're still playing with the graphic design, so it might look a little bit different next week. And that's it. Thank you.